History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No, it's deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is FDR's Right-Hand Woman. So given the enormous amount of devotion that today's topic had to FDR, her her boss, Margaret Missy Lehan served as FDR's secretary for over 20 years during his political career. And one of her defining characteristics was this outright devotion to her job and to him. So I wanted to start off like we usually do with a more in-depth than necessary philosophical discussion <laughs> about devotion. Because I what think the people come think here as... for. They want to hear us talk about our opinions on life. I'm um, sure. <laughs> so to start off, I mean, are you devoted to certain things? Like people, places, things in your life that you feel you show devotion towards? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think there are different levels of devotion. Like, obviously, my wife, like, that's obviously a very deep level of devotion because that's part of the commitment of marriage is being devoted to one another. Yeah. Um, and there are other people that I think you have that level of devotion to, your parents, your family, your if you have kids, your kids. Like, that's a very intimate type of devotion, but you have... I mean, some people on the, would equate on the same level their friends have devotions to that, but you can have devotions to people or places or things that aren't maybe as important or maybe a little more superficial, like devotion to sports teams or to, I don't know, people that are really into pop culture might be devoted to certain celebrities or actors. So I, I don't know that I would get yeah. that hung up about like, if something happened to a family member as a, compared to like a professional athlete, I'm going to pick the family member over them. But like devotion is, can be, I think it applies to both situations, just maybe on a different level. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that you're, there's, like you said, there's more love based, emotionally based personal devotion. Um, and then there's more surface level things like you mentioned pop culture, but I also think like uh, the workplace is another, uh, I think a little bit more um, subjective place where some people might feel a lot more devotion than others. Like I think a lot of people are pretty devoted to their families, uh, but I feel like as far as careers and work go, I know a lot of different people at different stages that are <laughs> various levels of devoted. Do you think devotion is generally a good thing? And under what conditions do you think it could be a bad thing? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's a good thing for the most part. Like, typically, if you're devoted to something, it's important to you and probably benefits you in some way. There certainly can be bad types of devotion. I mean, I think anything that you spend a lot of your time and energy on is at least in some level a form of devotion. Yeah. Uh, even if it's not a great thing a vice or some kind of guilty pleasure or something like even if you spend hours and hours watching tv like you might not consider yourself devoted to the television or whatever but if that's how you spend your time that's a, you're devoting that time to it and right like that's clearly something that's important to you even if it's not like the worst type of vice there are certainly things worse than watching hours of tv but just an example like that's something that maybe isn't the best way to spend your night every night <laughs> for hours on end. Right. Do you think there's a difference between commitment and devotion? Like a, a, a variable that makes something the one and not the other. I want to say yes, but I'm having a hard time like coming up with a separate definition for the two in my mind. Yeah. 
I, I feel that devotion implies a much more intimate feeling to it. Like commitment is more like something right. that you you know you have to do, whereas devotion is something that you maybe want to do. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I would. I, I was thinking loyalty um, is something that I think you don't necessarily need to be loyal to something to be committed to it. Like you said, you might not even want to do it. You just have to. Um, whereas devotion is a bit more free will based. And you, you, I mean, you're choosing to do it. Well, like you mentioned, even just bringing up your job, like people that are devoted to their work probably feel very passionately about it and like maybe don't even consider yeah. it work. It's something that they want to do. They go there and are excited about it. Whereas other people maybe aren't quote unquote devoted to their job might still be mm-hmm. committed to it. Where like, yeah, I go to work every day because I have to go to work every day because I need the paycheck or for whatever reason, like you, you go to work because that's what you do. But if you're not devoted to the work that you do, then maybe you're not super thrilled about having to go to work to get that paycheck. Right. So I, I do right. think there is a difference. It's just they, I think they can be used interchangeably in some senses, but I do feel that devotion has more of a, maybe an emotional background to it. Yeah. Well, the other thing I was thinking when contemplating this discussion is like devotion to ideas or ideals, um, which is a place I think the negative side of it can rear its head a little bit more when you see people in, you know, really weird cults or, you know, <laughs> not going to point anybody out, but like conspiracy theories that a lot of people end up having a lot of devotion to. We haven't um, done an episode about a cult yet. I feel like we should find that's a good true. one we for that. We really haven't. <laughs> they're interesting. When I do end up reading or watching something about them, they're really fascinating. If not, I, I heard a quote recently, the, the person was like, if you think you're the type of person who isn't susceptible to, you know, being inducted into a cult, then you're exactly the type of person who is susceptible. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, like, I don't think I would be, but that's, I guess that's just it. You don't but know. But every person who's in a cult doesn't think that they're in a cult. <laughs> right. Anyway, I feel like that would be a, a hard one to find a B-sider on though, because the, the big ones, you know, like the... Right. The ones that get real bad or the most interesting stories are usually the ones that people know about. So that might be one to research for down the yeah. road. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if a bad cult leader, not not bad as in evil, but bad as in, in ineffective. Unsuccessful. Wouldn't be a very interesting <laughs> yeah. People didn't want to follow him. Topic. People followed him for a short time and decided he was loony and left. <laughs> There's a story. That's the difference between being a good cult leader and a bad cult leader is whether or not people realize that you're loony. <laughs> History's B side guide to cult leadership. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't expect that one on this episode. I didn't. I didn't write that into the outline. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I mentioned, to move on from our discussion about devotion. Marguerite Lehand was extremely devoted to her employer, who was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And she worked for him for over 20 years throughout his political career, including his presidential terms. So like we often do, I wanted to start today's episode off with a brief overview of his presidency and time in office and some of the accomplishments while in office. So he started his political career pretty early on. He was a member of the New York State Senate from 1911 through 1913, and then moved on to be the Assistant Secretary of the Navy from 1913 until 1920. And it's when he worked for the Navy that he ended up being connected to Marguerite Lehand. But to move on from that, nine years later, he did run under James Cox ticket against Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge. Uh, and he would he would have been James Cox's vice president they ended up losing that race, of course. In 1929, he ended up becoming the 44th governor of New York, uh, which was a position he served for another three years until 1932. And then, of course, as we all know, he was elected as the 32nd president of the United States in 1933 and was the only president, right, to serve more than two terms? Yeah, he actually broke tradition by running for a third term. That was obviously mm. before we had term limits in the country. And that the constitutional amendment that would, you know, create two term limits for presidents 
was implemented shortly after he passed away while in office. Yeah. So yeah, he would be our first president that was elected to a third term and eventually to a fourth term, although he died only three months into that one. Yeah. So served twice as many terms as any other uh, U.S. president, if you don't count his fourth one ending early. But he got a number of important things done, of course, you know, leading the country through the majority of World War II. Uh, earlier on, he was a champion for economic reform in his New Deal, which was really a response to the Great Depression. You know, the country was in a, a, sta a poor state economically, and the New Deal was a, a series of economic reforms bent at recreating the economy that were all signed into law between 1933 and 1939. And we don't need to go too deep into that, but one of the easy ways to remember and refer to the efforts of this New Deal uh, are the three R's, which are relief for the unemployed, recovery of the economy back to normal levels, and reform of the financial system in order to prevent a repeat depression. And his New Deal kind of set up the Democratic Party as the Labor Party that we know today. And that's when the two parties started to take their more modern day stances. It's kind of funny because you think about like, what is Biden pushing to pass right now? The build back better agenda or something like that and yeah i'm not trying to equate the two at all because you know fdr is considered one of our greatest presidents in history and it's a little bit early to decide what how biden's <laughs> going to be viewed through that lens but yeah. i mean it, it's kind of the same idea of economic reform after going through a very very bad part of our <laughs> country's history as far as economy wise i mean the the great depression certainly wasn't caused by a global pandemic Although there was a global pandemic in the 1920, 1921. So yeah. I'm sure there was some would have been connection, recent. but not in the same way that of what we're going through today. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think it's a bad comparison. Of course, like you said, we don't know how Build Back Better will turn out. But I did read recently that it's the largest spending bill passed by the government passed by a president since the new deal by fdr i mean it's the biggest one in history is it not <laughs> we weren't spending so. trillions of dollars in the 1930s so that kind of gives us a, a background of what fdr was able to accomplish during his career he's one of the most well-known presidents because of these things especially because he served during world war ii uh, and he was also a popular president at the time a lot of people remember him for his fireside chats, which I think made him <laughs> a, a more uh, approachable folksy character than many presidents. Yeah, I so I got into a little bit of a rabbit hole on FDR last night when I was looking up some quiz questions for you at the end. And not to give any of those away, but I actually read that they've done obviously numerous scholarly surveys ranking presidents of history. And mm -hmm. the modern ones aren't necessarily in the same evaluation as the the more older i feel like that that's not the right way to say it but like the previous president so like trump and obama aren't necessarily gone through all the same comparisons because a lot of these surveys were conducted before they were either elected or they just haven't been able to evaluate over time as well but right. throughout history like fdr is considered in almost all these surveys either the one two or three top presidents like top three presidents and I wanted yeah. to make this one of your quiz questions, except that, like, there is no definitive ranking of American presidents. And I don't know. <laughs> I guess it's hard to really evaluate all of them fairly. But can you, I'm going to tease it to you a little quiz question early. Can you name which other two presidents are, like, consistently in the top three with FDR? Should be obvious. I would have to, I would have to say Abraham Lincoln. Yep, he's one of them. Like, it's a president that we have mentioned on our podcast. It's Although we've mentioned a lot of presidents in our pockets. No, it's not John F. Kennedy. Then I would have I would have to go with one of the original three, like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, just because of fame alone. Yeah, it's Washington. I mean, Jefferson's okay. usually up there too, but typically on almost all these surveys, the top three were either Washington, Lincoln, or FDR in some order. Yeah. Well, and that's just, that's, I guess, why it makes sense that you know, Bush and Obama and Trump can't really be fairly considered for this list because 
when you're talking about going that back far in history, I feel like the average American doesn't know much about George Washington's political policies while he was in office. Yeah. As far as whether or not they were good or well received or terrible, we just <laughs> know his name because he was the first president. And so much in the same way that like our first episode might always be one of the higher ranking ones because it's been around longer and had more time to accrue listens. I feel like George Washington gets an unfair advantage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true. And I don't know, regardless of anyone's political leanings or how you feel about certain presidents, neither Obama nor Trump were the greatest or worst presidents in history. <laughs> they just get that that's designation true. because they're we lived through it. Yeah, it's recent memory, like recency bias. I It was funny because while I was reading the same list of these surveys, they also surveyed who was believed to be the greatest president since World War II. And Obama was number two on both the greatest president since World War II and the worst president since World War II. <laughs> I feel like that's very indicative of our political climate. And there's no way he can be both. <laughs> the math just doesn't work out. <laughs> hey, you never know. I feel like the same would probably be true for Trump, right? Just with the sides switched. <laughs> uh, I mean, on the survey that I read, Trump was in the top five, possibly number one for worst president since World War II. He was not on the list that I read for greatest president since World War II. But there is a significant portion of the U.S. population that if you asked if he belonged on that list, would tell you that he is the greatest president in history. We at History's B-Side do not endorse any candidates for presidency currently. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> All right. So now to get into our, our the actual meat of our topic. <laughs> so Marguerite, or Missy Lehand, as she was known to the Roosevelts, was born on September 13th, 1896 in Potsdam, New York, to Daniel and Mary Lehand both the children of Irish immigrants. In her childhood, Lehan's family moved to Somerville, a working-class suburb of Boston, where she was struck by rheumatic fever at age 15. The illness permanently damaged her heart and would lead to her eventual premature death. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, ominous, ominous foreboding already. Your last topic Thing... was a woman who died young. It was the times. <laughs> 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 Apparently. Um, so in her early years, she studied secretarial science at Somerville High School, uh, and a secretarial position would have been fairly common for working women at this time. After graduating, she held a variety of clerical positions in the Boston area, but she eventually moved to Washington, D.C. in 1917 to serve as a clerk at the Department of the Navy during the First World War. Now, at this time, FDR was then serving as assistant secretary of the Navy, but the two did not meet during his service there. Three years later, at the recommendation of Charles McCarthy, Roosevelt's assistant at the Navy Department, Lehan became a secretary with FDR's vice presidential campaign when he ran on a ticket with James Cox against Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge, which I previously mentioned they would go on to lose that race, of course. Do you know where... The vice presidential campaigns separate from the presidential campaigns at this time I in history? I don't know. I looked. It didn't appear so. They, I mean, they were on the same ticket. It's not as though he could have beat out. Right. That's weird that he had his own secretary for his campaign. Or maybe I just don't know enough about political campaigns. I mean, I feel like it's possible. Like, I don't know. I don't think it would be wild to know that like Joe Biden had his own campaign secretary during Obama's campaigning, even though he's not really, I guess that's true. They, at the forefront, they do their own political events and things like that. So he probably yeah. would have been traveling separate from his running mate or something like that. Right. So that's, I imagine what was going on here. I don't think they ran separately and won one separately. So Missy's work on the campaign and her evident personal devotion to FDR eventually caught the eye of the Roosevelts. And in early 1921, FDR hired her as his personal secretary, and she moved to the Roosevelt's home in Hyde Park, New York, where Roosevelt practiced law and served as vice president of the Fidelity and Deposit Company. So this is kind of the point at which her tenure as his secretary begins in 1921, and they're pretty 
they seem pretty open to her joining the family. She moved into the house with the family and from this point on rarely left FDR's side. And this is when I think her devotion to him as both a political candidate and a person began. So but this is like not just a working relationship. Like she moved into the house with them and was like, I guess when you say personal secretary, that's not relevant to what his current job is. Like literally right. was with him at all times. Yeah. I mean, and, and we'll get into this after our break, but you know, once he contracted polio, he became partially paralyzed. He needed a lot more assistance, which she was often there to provide. But yeah, I think in a lot of ways she did more and was more involved in his life and the family's lives than your average secretary would have been. Hmm. But before we get into her tenure as his secretary, I wanted to take a short break and we'll be right back. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. You just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show, we sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. At buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or $100 a year. Being a member gains you some pretty cool perks. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, History's B-Side Battles, access to our future episode queue, a name shout out on a future episode. We'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set, and more perks will be announced as we continue on. There's also some different extras that people can get on our Buy Me A Coffee website. Things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah? You owe me a coffee. Oh. Do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. All right, welcome back. So when we left off, we found Missy LeHand having just been hired by the Roosevelts to pretty much join their family in New York and become FDR's full-time secretary. But shortly thereafter, in the aftermath of Franklin's battle with polio, which ended up leaving him partially paralyzed in 1921, Missy became indispensable to him and spent most of her time by his side. I guess I never realized that FDR's polio and, like, the paralysis from that happened in adulthood. I feel like in my mind, I always thought he had polio as a kid and like was always in a wheelchair. Yeah. But I guess this happened later in life. <laughs> well, see, and I have like an almost opposite memory that's still incorrect because I had this idea that he started his presidency fine and then at some point had it and then became paralyzed. And I don't know why I thought that because it's well, clearly not right. <laughs> it's like a big thing that he didn't want to be portrayed in a wheelchair like it was a probably because he was technically a wartime president obviously leading yeah. the u.s into world war ii but it was sort of like a not wanting to be perceived as weak like a symbol of strength mm -hmm. that he wouldn't be seen in a wheelchair so even like in his presidential portraits and i think the fdr monument in washington dc like he's not seen in a wheelchair he's seen sitting 
And I think in the, the monument, they have like a blanket over his lap. So if he is in a wheelchair, it's like the wheelchair is covered up. But I think his portrait is basically just from the torso up and like yeah. seated, but not in a wheelchair. Yeah, I mean, I, I think his campaign alone and any PR people around him probably were and himself would have wanted him to maintain a stronger presence. And I think that was a big part of not wanting him pictured in a wheelchair or seen in a wheelchair. Yeah, I feel like I've read too that at big events and speeches, he did tend to like stand up, probably with assistance, but they would have him standing so that he wouldn't be perceived as like incapable of supporting himself. Yeah. I have this specific, I think it's in Pearl Harbor, but it's a specific scene in a movie that is about World War II, and I'm almost 100% sure it's the movie Pearl Harbor, but he's like trying to decide whether or not to respond to the attack and he stands up out of his wheelchair and everybody's like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> anyway of course after having this condition this disease and becoming partially paralyzed lahan became a lot more important and integral to his daily functioning as he did need often need somebody there by his side during the following winters spent with a small party on the Larocco, which was fdr's houseboat lahan acted as a hostess in eleanor roosevelt's absence a reliable companion to FDR, Lahan learned to play poker, adopted his figures of speech, and enjoyed his favorite cocktails. <laughs> so, like, already, I feel like much more than a secretary, you know? I I almost I mean, want to use, like... She's like a go. friend, too. Yeah. And I think this makes sense for, I mean, people who work this closely together. When FDR traveled to Warm Springs, Georgia for physical therapy, Lahand accompanied him and worked with him there to establish the first polio rehabilitation center in the country, incorporated in 1927 as the Georgia Warm Springs Foundation. That spring, Lahand suffered what she described as a heart attack, but others suspected she had suffered a mental breakdown. Do you know what may have caused the mental breakdown? I honestly, it sounds kind of dramatic, but is part of the a big part of the story. I think she was just that involved and interested in his his life. And at this time, he's going through physical therapy. He's having some health problems. And I think she was just so, so devoted to him and his success and his health that this, this period of time would have been very stressful for her, I think. And, you know, anybody working this hard at their job all the time would probably experience some sense of burnout. Yeah, I get that. I like my bosses, but I don't think I would, uh, I don't know. Accompany them to physical therapy. <laughs> Deteriorate my own health <laughs> worrying about them. Although that makes me feel like a jerk to say, so <laughs> I like my bosses. I mean, yeah. I don't Self-care is important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, and the thing is, I think she was interested enough in her job that it would have held a fair bit of meaning and passion for her and that that would make it easier to deal with full time but i think his situation and it's kind of at this time at least how fickle it was caused her a great deal of stress one of the few people who actually encouraged fdr's return to politics lahand opposed his plan to run for governor of new york in 1928 fearing the interruption in his physical therapy would prevent a full recovery when he decided to run, she suffered another illness often described as a nervous breakdown. So I feel like it, it the first one was probably also caused by him, given that the second one shortly followed this huge decision of his. Hold on. So I'm confused here. She encouraged his return to politics, but she didn't want him to run for governor? Right. I think she encouraged him to want to eventually return to politics. I think what she disagreed with was how early. I think she wanted oh, him to okay. finish his physical therapy, get back to health. And I think she probably would have preferred he wait till the next election to run. But she so, did encourage his return to the political world. So do you know, like, did he... Obviously, he didn't necessarily listen to her exactly in this, this context. Did he often listen to her? Like, was her opinion to him valued so much that he would take her advice? Or did he kind of just do whatever he, whatever he wanted to do regardless? I mean, I think she had a role in influencing his decision, but I don't know if it's as black and white as he just listened to her advice. I think he probably just took it into consideration among other factors and other people in his life um, and his own decision. I think he, at the end of the day, he seems like a president that was going to 
make the decision he felt was right regardless of what other people wanted. I also feel like in this situation, given his success throughout the rest of his life, even living with this partial paralysis, he was a very headstrong person and probably was chomping at the bit to get out of physical therapy and back to right. the political world. I think you'd have a hard time finding a president who was not a headstrong individual. <laughs> Honestly, maybe Lincoln, if I, from what I've read about <laughs> him, might be the only one who was like, I don't know, didn't want to be headstrong, even though he probably was. <laughs> it's, it's not a position you get by being a passive <laughs> individual. <laughs> so, as we know, he didn't listen to her. He ran for governor and received the position. Um, and by the time he was elected and assumed office, Lehand had resumed work and moved into the governor's mansion to continue her role as secretary. And it's here, even now, like, before she's started to be considered a de facto chief of staff, as we'll find out in a moment, I already feel like she's kind of acting like a chief of staff in certain ways. Like, you see the chief of staff uh, with different presidents being very involved and always there. Uh, and she kind of is that. Though I don't think at this early time she had as much suggestive control as she might have later gained. So as we know, he's governor for three years uh, and then becomes is elected to be the 32nd president of the United States. And of course, Lahand followed him to the White House where she became the first woman to serve as a presidential secretary. With Lewis Howe, Steve Early, and Marvin McIntyre, she was the only female member of the secretariat that managed the West Wing. So he really did just kind of make a position for her wherever he went. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. much. I guess she had a formal position. It wasn't just like she was still his personal secretary. Did she actually have a job within the White House that she was receiving some kind of executive salary or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was an official employee of the White House administration. A 1933 Newsweek profile described her as Roosevelt's super secretary and brought her national fame. In 1934, she appeared on the cover of Time magazine, only one of three women to receive a cover feature that year. Any idea who the other two were? Just out of curiosity. I, I, knew, don't... <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. Um, I don't know who the other women that were featured on the cover that year was. But if anybody wants to find out or knows a lot about Time Magazine's history, <laughs> please please send us an email. We'd love to know. Maybe yeah. they could become future B-siders. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Lehand was a popular guest among Washington society. She was glamorous. In fact, Lehand was on Washington's best dress list for 1937. She was also vivacious and playful with her West Wing co-workers. So it seems like she was a fairly well-respected and well-received person in Washington society. Was the best dressed something that was only awarded to women? Just thinking probably the times. I don't know. I I don't know. I imagine not. I feel like it would make sense for them to have both, but men's dress was also not that interesting at this time. I mean, you and uh... it's not like you had Lil Nas X and Harry Styles wearing <laughs> like C-3PO gowns at the Met Gala. Things I did not expect to come up on the FDR personal secretary <laughs> podcast. Cults and Lil Nas X. <laughs> we're, a, we're a varied bunch over here at History's B-Side. <laughs> but once again, you share a unique personal connection to our B-Sider as having one best dressed. Oh, that's true. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> My dress has definitely gone down in, in its quality. Well, her award was Since probably a little school. more prominent than the high school class of 2011. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like they're comparable. <laughs> Washington's best dressed and Borman High School's best dressed. So as he moved into his second term, Lahan's importance only increased. Following Lewis Howe's death in 1936, she became the de facto White House Chief of Staff. Following Lewis Howe's death in 1936, she became the de facto White House Chief of Staff and was the only woman to serve in this position. Has there been any sense? Do you know? I don't think so. Multiple articles said she was the only one, and I can't remember any that I know of. That's really interesting. I, I guess I'm a little surprised that there hasn't been one since, if there has not. Um, 
obviously we could be missing yeah. that but i'm a little surprised because that that's quite a while ago that we have not had another female chief of staff i mean it says there was obama had a deputy chief of staff for operations named Alyssa mastromonaco but i don't think that's the head chief yeah, of staff not the, the way. same position right but yeah she was Certainly the first, and as far as we know, the only female chief of staff, which is kind of a big accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And like many chiefs of staff, she was at FDR's bedside every morning as he met with key advisors, vetted his mail, spent evenings with the president in his private study, accompanied him on weekend cruises on the presidential yachts, very fancy, <laughs> and acted as a gatekeeper to the president. She basically provided a backdoor entrance to the Oval Office. She was recognized as one of the most powerful people in FDR's administration at this time. This role sounds basically like what Edith Wilson was doing from our very first That's episode. I <laughs> yeah. I mean, she might, sounds like she's being a little more transparent about it. Like Edith Wilson potentially was keeping certain people out and making decisions yeah. herself. But it's interesting that these presidents that were, I don't want to say FDR was incapacitated, but he was definitely disabled and not maybe not always in the best health to lead the country, but both of them had a yeah. strong willed woman by their side to yeah. kind of help them run the country. <laughs> no, she sound her story sounded exactly like Edith Wilson's. And I repeatedly thought that as I did the research that this was kind of like her, uh, history's B side spiritual successor. <laughs> <laughs> well, then again, Woodrow Wilson probably had his own chief of staff that didn't, or had to go through Edith Wilson too, but <laughs> right. <laughs> sounds like maybe Eleanor Roosevelt was a little more hands off than Edith Wilson was. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> now, I thought this multiple times up until reading what I'm about to say next. And I imagine you might have the same thoughts too, but we've talked about them being friends and her adopting his gestures and manner of speaking and drinking his favorite cocktail and spending time in his study. And though the exact nature of FDR's relationship with Lehand is debated by historians, it's generally accepted that there was an element of romance between the two of them. That there was? There was an element okay. of romance between the two, which is kind of... I, 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 it's not surprising that somebody that spent this, this much time next to him would develop romantic feelings. It surprises me that a president of that level, I don't know, would do that or would be, it wouldn't be so poorly received. Like, I mean, Bill Clinton was impeached. <laughs> well, I mean, when you talked about, you know, developing similar mannerisms and sharing their love of cocktails and playing poker, like I started to kind of suspect that there might have been something right. more than just a professional relationship between the two of them. And I think, either you mentioned it or I read it, that it's not like confirmed that there was anything untoward between them, but it's almost mm -hmm. kind of hard to imagine that there wasn't because I don't know. It does seem that they had a personal intimate relationship and yeah, if nothing else, maybe FDR would have considered Lahand his quote unquote work wife. <laughs> work wife. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's just yeah. like, I didn't want to make an assumption about our B setter. If we're talking about, you know, a, strong willed powerful woman it doesn't mean that she got to that position because she was doing something she shouldn't have with the male right. boss no, that she I... worked for but you know it, it's hard to imagine that there wasn't some kind of personal relationship between them given their closeness yeah i mean maybe i'm giving too much benefit of the doubt but i feel like it's not as scandalous as you know she slept her way into the white house right absolutely I think there probably was just a, a, an emotional element for them. Like you said, how could there not be when you spend that much time with per, with a person and adopt all of their you know personal preferences as your own? Right. But despite this, Lehand was romantically involved with other people in her lifetime, most notably with William Bullitt, the U.S. ambassador to Russia and then later France during FDR's presidency. Though... Her devotion to Roosevelt was the most likely impediment to marriage. She once asked a friend, how could anyone ever come up to FDR? So like you said, maybe they didn't actually have a romantic relationship, but she obviously had some, on some level, romantic feelings toward him. 
Yeah, I mean, this kind of confirms that, I feel like. I mean, she's either too dedicated to her job to, to get married, or I guess a slightly different version of that is she's too dedicated to him, which makes me feel like there are, yeah. are some romantic feelings there. In June of 1941, Missy LeHand collapsed at a White House dinner party, and two weeks later suffered a major stroke that left her partially paralyzed and barely able to speak. In early 1942, she spent some weeks in her old room at the White House, but quickly deteriorated over frustration that she was no longer able to work. After an incident in which she set the bed on fire, probably while smoking, <laughs> it wasn't like a, she didn't like intentionally set the bed on fire. <laughs> when I first read that, I thought she was just like acting out, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, throwing a temper tantrum about being sick or in her bed or whatever. No, it, it appears that it was an accidental bed bed fire <laughs> what i mean isn't it amazing how far medicine has come that they used to allow people to smoke in their bed while receiving treatment right. <laughs> <laughs> you've had a major stroke three days bed rest here's some cigarettes pack of cigs <laughs> <laughs> there's actually really early on in like the marketing of cigarettes there was an ad program that ran that described smoking as a healthy activity that cleared out the lungs. And I'm sure like it made you cough up bad stuff. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's insanity. <laughs> I, I think I have a topic that might relate to that coming up. So <laughs> maybe I'll read more about that. I can't wait. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you're sick here. We're going to put some leeches on you. Have a cigarette. <laughs> By the way, this, Old fashioned with, with bourbon whiskey is is meant to clean out your gut. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> eventually, as her condition deteriorated, Lehand ended up returning to her sister's home in Somerville, Massachusetts. After her departure from the White House, Lehand never saw FDR again, though he did keep in touch with her through letters, phone calls, and gifts. Lehan died after having a second stroke in 1944 at the age of 48. So she did precede FDR in death. Mm -hmm. Not by much, though. No. It was close. <laughs> <laughs> FDR's political advisor and speechwriter, Samuel Rosenman, called Lehan one of the most important people of the Roosevelt era. The president's words, quote, she was utterly selfless in her devotion to duty appear on Lehand's grave marker at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Hmm. So it almost appears like she secretaried herself to death on some <laughs> level. Like, she, I mean, I, I don't, she had two mental breakdowns. Obviously, the initial condition of her having these strokes was caused by a much earlier disease, but I feel like she was just devoted to the end. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that she maybe was a little bit too devoted to her job like to put her own health at stake but uh it, it certainly shows how stressful that job can be that she she wasn't the president she was supporting the president and it still basically killed her like deteriorated her health to the point of her dying young yeah do you know like you didn't really get into this too much but do you know if she had any impact on fdr's decision making at least when it came to jumping into world war ii like the u.s entering the war i don't i don't know there wasn't any direct reference of specific things beyond his return to politics nobody really mentioned specific pieces of advice that she provided him she may have been pretty much retired at that point considering her health was starting to go because yeah. the u.s did enter fairly late into the war she would have been around as the war was starting but Probably not so much when the U.S. entered it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine that she was close enough to him that she would have had a little bit of input, like I said earlier, but as far as how much and how much he was devoted to her opinion, <laughs> um, it probably depended on a lot of other factors that we can't really know. But it's, it is pretty unquestionable that she had 
some influence over him as somebody so close to him in his life that he eventually came to, you know, have certain feelings for and spend most of his time with. And just the fact that he brought her on to every new position that he took, like whether it was yeah. the governor or the presidency or anything else, like she was always there. He always hired her on and kept her around. So clearly she had a lot of, I mean, even her professional relationship, like her opinion meant something to him. That he, yeah. He viewed her as valuable. Yeah. I mean, if she was constantly spewing terrible advice that he didn't think was correct, I doubt he would have repeatedly <laughs> brought her on and given her positions. <laughs> but yeah, as far as like entering World War II, I don't, I don't know if she had a direct hand in that. We usually ask this question at the end of our episodes, and I feel like this is an obvious answer maybe, but do we think, do we think Missy Lehand is a good person? <laughs> I don't know that she's given us any reason to view her otherwise. I mean, I think just through the context of history, FDR is viewed as one of our best presidents. And if she was yeah. influential on him and an important part of his administration, I think she was, she can at least be viewed through a positive light in history that she was important and influential on an influential person. If yeah. you're talking like morally good, we don't know enough about her, but I'm assuming that she was That's okay. True. She Unless, could have been a terrible person behind the scenes. I mean, if she was stealing a married man from his wife, then uh, maybe that's not the best thing, but we don't know that that was for sure true. Yeah. Well, I actually just found this in, in looking for some information on her actions during World War II, but his older brother, Jimmy, disagreed that they had a physical affair. A, because his illness was a bit too progressed to have regular <laughs> sex um <laughs> and Great also tag on this episode <laughs> well i'm just i mean i just read it and i find it interesting that his oh, her, his brother disagreed that they were like physically involved with one another and it was probably more of like a an emotional fondness yeah that's fair i, I guess that's kind of how i would view it when you're talking yeah. about them being so close and even taking on each other's traits like you're obviously going to have some kind of at least emotional attachment to that person I think that happens a lot with actual like couples, like married couples too. The longer you you are together and live together, you start to resemble each other in certain ways. Right. When she was involved with Eleanor too, it's not like the two of them were always separate. She lived with the family, so she would have been almost as close to Eleanor. Yeah. As a result. Yeah, All not right. to give anything away for your upcoming quiz, but there'll be a little bit about how Eleanor felt about FDR's women. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't wait. And there's your little tease, so ready for the quiz? Yeah, I think so. All right, take a quick break, and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. As most of our listeners know, we like to end every episode with just a short three-question quiz to kind of test today's host, see how much he studied his topic and maybe some things that came up while studying his topic. And maybe the listener is sort of familiar with today's person and can answer some of these as we go along. Are you ready? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to do well because FDR has a huge <laughs> rap sheet and I didn't study a lot of it, so... There's nothing super, super detailed about FDR's presidency. One of these you might have gotten just from researching Marguerite Lehand. One is technically from her Wikipedia page, although it's more about FDR. So I don't know if you read the Wikipedia page or got this at all. And then the yeah. last one is just going to be about U.S. presidents in total. So it, it shouldn't be terribly difficult. I think you will do okay, at least. Ready? All right. I feel good about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So question number one. Every workday, FDR and his staff held a cocktail hour where they drank martinis and discussed policy. Now, Eleanor mm. Roosevelt, his wife, was a teetotaler. She opposed alcohol. 
so she would not be involved with these cocktail hours. So Lahand often served as the hostess for these cocktail hours, which were affectionate which were affectionately called what? I know I read this. <laughs> it was something, it was like the... I don't want to say it was children's time. It had something to do with children, though. Was it, chil- it, was it children's hour? Spot on! The children's was hour. Was it children's hour? <laughs> I remember it being about children. I was like, why? This yeah. seems odd. It was weird. I was trying to figure out why it was called the children's hour because that doesn't seem like what you would call a cocktail hour. But I guess it stems from the name of uh, well, a Henry Wadsworth Longfellow poem by the same name. And I skimmed the poem. I don't really know what it has to do with a cocktail hour, but maybe I just didn't read it very, <laughs> very thoroughly. But yeah, apparently FDR liked his Longfellow poetry. I, I don't... I don't want to make a dark... Actually, I'm lying. I do absolutely want to make a dark joke at this point in our podcast. But can you imagine what the Pizzagate people would do if the Clintons held a cocktail hour? hour oh, my gosh. Hour? <laughs> There'd be mass hysteria. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Question number two. Question number two. In March of 1945, an 18,000-ton Liberty ship was named the SS Marguerite Lahand. What was notable about this ship's maiden voyage? Oh, God. What was the year again? March of 1945. It was dedicated to her shortly after she passed. Hmm. What was notable about it? Your hint is that Did... it is not a good thing. Oh, okay. I was going to say maybe it dropped off like the first American D-Day soldiers or something. Um, (laughs) Was it sunk? Was it like the last ship sunk by Nazi submarines or something? (laughs) No. (laughs) So the the Marguerite or the SS Marguerite Lehan did not sink, but it did strike a U.S. Coast Guard vessel named Magnolia and sunk that vessel. (laughs) <laughs> and killed one sailor. <laughs> wow. All right. Not great. I don't I don't think I would have ever guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not not the best way to uh honor Lehand with a definitely not unsuccessful maiden voyage. All right. So this is your final question is going to be the one that maybe makes you a little uncomfortable with American history. But mm. I don't know. It's it's a part of history, and like we said, not always great. So, we discussed a lot about the personal relationship between Lahand and FDR, and while that, I guess, the romantic aspect to it is more speculated than anything verified, Roosevelt did engage in a 20-year affair with another woman, including while he served as president. Your question's not about that specifically, but... Okay. I did find that over a third of all former U.S. presidents have allegedly engaged in extramarital affairs, fathered a child out of wedlock, or been accused of sexual misconduct. Which is really sad to think about, that yeah, over a third of American presidents have been at least accused of these things. Right. How many of those presidents can you name? Oh, God. I mean, I guess Bill Clinton is <laughs> yep, the first He's on one. the list. <laughs> <clears throat> Trump. He's on the list. At least as far as, of course. Yeah, I, don't I, sh- yeah, I like, should oh. caveat that this didn't necessarily all take place while they were president, although yeah, the majority of them did. I'm going to throw Andrew Jackson in there just because he was a general piece of garbage. <laughs> yes, but his is probably, I don't want to say the least bad of all these, but he his was just that the woman that he married, he married her before she was legally divorced from her previous marriage. So that's the only one that's like more of a gray area than just outright did something bad. <laughs> yeah. I guess. So what is that? That's 4. I need 15. <laughs> this is terrible. Um There's actually 17 on I mean, my I... list. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. So you did say over a third. Um yeah. I feel You like... don't have to get them all. I'm just curious how many you can guess. He's largely looked at as like 
a, a friendly president, but t- I feel like Teddy Roosevelt might have had some shady things going on. Actually, not on the list. No, all right. I'm going to say Ronald Reagan. Nope. Just because he was an... No, okay. I don't know. <laughs> well, we had quite a few early on that fathered a child with a slave. So, like, Washington, Jefferson, William Henry Harrison. I'm not going to go through and name all them, but the the longest list were guys that had extramarital affairs. Uh, some of the more obvious ones would be, like, JFK, who pretty much slept with anything that could walk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Johnson who was a little more subtle about his sleeping around than JFK, but claimed that I can't he believe was I didn't think more successful at it. Was so dumb. <laughs> Both of the Bushes had been accused of having extramarital affairs. I think, hmm. I don't know if those were confirmed or just alleged, but they both had been accused of essentially the same thing. The really bad one was Grover Cleveland, who apparently, I don't know if, I think it was before he was president, but maybe it was while president, was accused of having raped someone, which... Not great. Nope. But like, just imagine. Okay, never mind. I shouldn't say that because I was going to say, just imagine if this happened in today's world. But like, clearly, there were some, a lot of allegations surrounding a very recent president. (laughs) So I I almost feel like if this were to happen today, we'd have half the country that said, no, that's absolutely not true. There's no way she's a liar. Like all this stuff. And it's just like, presidents, not always the best dudes. Nope. No, clearly not a third of them <laughs> <laughs> or more. I should have guessed more of the early ones. I feel like people were a lot more. Uh, oh, yeah. Willy yeah. nilly about their For <laughs> sure. Uh, willy nilly about their willy. <laughs> <laughs> and on and that on note. That note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Willy nilly about their willy. We need a T-shirt with that on it. <laughs> Coming soon to oh, the boy. History's B-Side merch store. <laughs> I want willy buttons. <laughs> uh, as always, we really appreciate our listener support, and we really have a good time putting these episodes together for you, and it's awesome that we have some folks that enjoy listening. If you want to reach out to us with any questions or comments, or forget what people are supposed to tell us that we didn't know in this episode... The other two Uh, women on the 1937 Time Magazine cover. 1933, Uh, I think. Was it 1933? Come on, Matt. Learn your own topic. It was was 1934. Oh. (laughs) If you want to reach out to us and let us know what the other cover, the other cover features were that year, please hit us up at historiesbside at gmail.com, or you can always find us on social media. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. And follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side. <laughs>